Well, good morning, Village Church. It's good to be here. I'm already a little nervous, though. This is my first time on the stage here. For those of you that have only been coming recently, we used to preach from down there, and I had a lot of room to, a lot of room to roam. I'm feeling a little confined right now, so just a real quick prayer that I don't end up down there or I don't end up back in there somewhere. So I'd really appreciate that. But for those that are, that are new with us, uh, we've been in a series called Power Passages. And Kevin and Drews have delivered some powerful messages using these power passages. And I just hope I can continue to do the same. But again, now that, uh, now that I'm here, I'm just looking for success for me just to be able to stand up here and give the message uh, without, uh, without hurting myself. But not only that, I have another problem. And for you sports fans, I'm sorry, but I, I've, I've just got to talk about this. It's, it's going to be my therapy session for the next minute or two. Is that if you're not a college football fan, what has happened this past week is four conferences have canceled their football seasons. And yes, thank you for the, thank you for the support. And of course, two of those conferences are the two teams that I follow, Air Force in the Mountain West Conference and the Buckeyes in the Big Ten. No football this summer. I just can't believe it. The good news is, is that I'm going to have some extra free time this fall, uh, which I'm sure I'll be able to fill somehow. But the bad news is no football for the first time in my life that I can remember. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit. But I want to use it as a, as a setup for my power passage this morning. So, so a couple of weeks back, Ed and I were talking about this, actually texting about this. And before I go any further, I just want to give a, give a shout out to Ed and to John and to Dave and the Kyle who leads this team. All of the audio and video that you see is a direct result of their hard work uh, week after week. So a little, little shout out to them. So Ed, Ed and I were, were texting back and forth, and Ed says, hey, I don't think it's going to happen. And I, and I text back Ed, and I said, Ed, we are playing ball this fall. No doubt, we are playing ball this fall. Well, we had two different perspectives, right? He didn't think we were going to play. I thought we were going to play, using the same information. And here's what had happened. My desire to watch ball this season overrode what was in front of me. It overtook reality. And so it ended up, because I ignored it, I was wrong. So my hope this morning is that our different perspectives are set in line with reality, and most importantly, God's reality. So this morning, we're going to take our power passage from the book of Romans, specifically chapter 8. And if you've heard us preach before on chapter 8, it is probably the most informative or important book and chapter of the entire Bible. If you need to memorize one chapter of the Bible, Romans 8 is it. That's the one you need to, to choose. And we're going to use it along with other passages because if one passage is good, a lot more is better. So and as if you've heard me preach before, that's exactly uh, what we're going to do uh, this morning. But we're going to use it to reveal a reality that we just can't miss that I think we might have. I know I don't have to tell you this, but we're in, amongst, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, right? But it has affected us all in one way or another. I have struggled at times to make sense of it. And even worse, I've not handled it well especially to my wife, which she's the one that has to bear the brunts of my frustrations on a daily basis. I have not handled it well at all. And one reason I have not handled it as well is because I think that we as the church have the greatest opportunity than we have ever had in our lifetime. I honestly believe that we have the greatest opportunity to make an impact for the kingdom of God and to take care of one another like we've never had before in our lifetime. But here's the rub. 
from a personal standpoint, I'm not sure we know what to do and how to do it. And I will get to more of that in a second. So when opportunities like this present themselves, this is what I do. I take a step back, I pause, and I assess. I try to figure it out. I figure out what's important and what's not as important. And I make some decisions and I move out. For you, uh, for you folks that are familiar with some army terminology, we say move out and draw fire. That's what we do. We take action. We go do something and then we adjust as we go along. So we move out and we do something. So here's my assessment of our current situation. This pandemic has left us bare. I believe it really has. And instead of making an impact, many of us are struggling. And many of us were struggling before the pandemic hit. And so that leaves us to only survive if we were struggling. So we're either struggling or we're just surviving. And here's the most tragic part. We've settled for this kind of life. We've settled for it. So I want you to listen, and I want you to hear me. This type of life that I just described is not the kingdom life. It's not what the kingdom life is about. It's not the way it is supposed to be, and we have accepted that it is that way. It's not it. My message this morning is, and I've prayed a lot for this week's message, it's not meant to condemn. It's not meant to make you feel guilty. It's not meant for any of that, I promise you. But it is meant to be challenging. Whenever we try to align ourselves with the Word of God, it is going to be challenging. And so, hang on. But before we open up the our Bibles to Romans, I want to remind us of who we were supposed to be, what we were meant to be. And I love, it's amazing me, God just continues to amaze me. If you missed the 930 Bible study, there were so many points that were made that I'm just going to ride on that it's, God amazes me and I love it. And he has, he has set us up for those that were in the Bible study beautifully. For today. So let me talk about what we were meant to be, and we're most, more so than we are today. And I'm going to read in Genesis 1. It's a familiar verse to us. Verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. We were meant to be image bearers of the one true God image bearers. We're meant to be his representatives. And, and this is the second half that is often overlooked, is we were meant to rule with him in his creation. I mean, think about that. Let that settle in for a moment. We were created to be his representatives and to rule with him. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, most of us know the next part of the story, and it just didn't quite work out that way, did it? We botched the plan, to say it plain and simple. Fortunately, that is when God initiated his rescue mission, to rescue us and win us back to him. And that mission entered an epic phase for humanity when God the Father sent his son and he came to earth for one primary purpose, and that was to defeat the enemy. An enemy that did not want us to represent God or rule with him. We have an enemy. Now, I realize when I'm up here, I like to put my foot on the gas and I like to just keep it hammered down. So I know I've got to take a breath, put my foot off the grass, gas, so I'm going to do it for a second here. 
If you're a student of church history, okay, you may be familiar with the Westminster Catechism. Interesting, its purpose was to align church congregations across Europe and to teach those people about the Christian faith. It was composed of questions and answers. So I'm going to start to put my foot on the gas again here. Because the first question is the question of all questions. That first question is, what is the chief end of man or woman? What is the chief end of man or woman? And the answer is, according to the catechism, which I believe as well, is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let me read that again. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So if our end is to do that, then we ought to know how to do that, right? Well, let's see if we can figure it out. So let's go to Romans 8. Pull out your Bible, your Bible apps. Take out a notepad because you need to scribble some notes down. And if you're not, I'm going to be bothered if I don't see anybody scribbling a note or two. Because this is going to be good stuff. All right? So let's, Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against them who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 37, our power passage. No. I'm going to skip 36. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The apostle Paul calls us conquerors. So I heard this verse. I remembered this verse. And I said, what a power passage this could be. And I said, this is a slam dunk. It was not even close to a slam dunk because every direction that I went, every turn that I took, God took me in a different direction. I just, I couldn't get on track with him until, and I'll fill in the blank later. The apostle Paul calls us conquerors. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm conquering much these days. Are you kidding me? And that's a problem. Because the scripture says we are. Or better said, we can be. We can be. And all of these verses are really talking about the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Paul throws in this unique passage that's very encouraging and inspiring. And that's why I went down the course that I did. But what does it have to do with glorifying God or the love of God? Well, it definitely does, but not in the way that you might think. Because initially when you think of conquering, you know, we think of defeating something, defeating an enemy, defeating an opponent, and that's that's part true. But remember when I was talking about God's reality. The means in the way that we conquer is totally different. It's like we like to say around here sometimes, it's counterculture. But the means of the way we conquer and become conquerors is very, very different. So what do we do? Well, it starts, it, it starts with understanding of what God has done and is doing for us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then we have what we need to live that type of life, a conquering life. Let's take a look at verse 34 again. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So listen to that. Jesus is right this moment interceding for you and I 
at God's right hand. Okay, what's, what does that mean, God's right hand? It just means it's a, it's a metaphorical term that just shows that God or Jesus is sharing God the Father's power and is involved in our life. Or said a different way, He is in control. And if you've been with us in our Bible study, you would have known in Psalm 110, it also talks about how everything is subjected to Him. So He is in control and everything is subjected to Him. And this is where the complications and the contradictions of our Christian life start. And we as pastors, this is one of our greatest challenges, is to try to explain the complexities, the contradictions, or the apparent contradictions. And all of that just doesn't, and some of that just does not make sense to us, and it's hard to explain, and this is one of those. Because we look around, we see chaos and confusion and hate and strife on a daily basis. And we question if Jesus is really in control. We do. Be honest. We question that. And then we ask, how do I conquer if I'm really not sure Jesus is in control? And the answer is, we don't. We don't. But do not despair, because for no other reason, if you read the Scriptures and believe the Scriptures, the Scriptures tell us exactly that He is. And there are many more reasons to build on those Scriptures. I, I, I have to go no further than this morning. I texted Kyle, said, hey, this is my power passage. He didn't know what it was. He sends back the playlist for this morning's worship and the follow-up song. It matches perfectly. It's unbelievable. I'm back there crying because I can't believe the words that are being sung because it's, every single song was taken out of part of my message and he had no idea. Jesus is in control. So again, let's go to verse 37 once more. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So what are all these things that I'm supposed to be a conqueror of? Well, we just have to bounce up to the second half of verse 35. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Those sound like some things we need to conquer, yes? Can wrap it up in all in one word. Sounds like suffering to me, does it not? Sufferings. And this is where more complications and contradictions come into play, right? It is the suffering that causes us to believe that we are not conquerors. Think about that. It's the suffering that causes us not to believe that we can conquer. Because it paralyzes our lives. Suffering paralyzes us. And it's the reason that we go into this survivor mode of life day after day. So if you're like me, the next logical question is, so then why do we suffer? What's the purpose of it? What's the need for it? This is where you need to start listening really carefully. Number one, I mentioned it earlier. We have an enemy who does not want us to glorify God represent him, and enjoy him. We have an enemy. Number two, we live in a fallen world. Adam and Eve made a mistake by the trickery of that enemy, which has created a lot of the mess that we're living in today. We live in a fallen world. That's number two. Number three, which is related to the both of them, we have an enemy that hates us. When are we going to get it through our lovely heads that we have an enemy that hates us and wants to do what? All we have to do is go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking someone to devour. 
That should grab your attention. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. There's the word, undergoing the sufferings. Now, the last reason and probably the most important reason that's related to our power passage for today is the reason that you do not want to hear. Suffering gives us our greatest opportunity to glorify God. I'm going to say it again because we don't want to hear it, and some of you did not hear me. Suffering gives us our greatest opportunity to glorify God. It's just like I was talking about earlier about the church. We have a great opportunity, but if we as a church and we as a people do not learn what suffering is about, we can't make an impact for the kingdom. We just can't do it. Which usually leads us to where I want to go next. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now I know what you're thinking. What does this have to do with conquering? Okay, well, let's take a look at a couple parallels between Romans 8, 35, and this verse right here that we've just read, or these verses right here. Okay, verse 35, remember, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? So you look up at back at Matthew 6, you have, what shall we eat? What shall we wear? You see the parallel there, okay? You see the parallel. In comparison, it looks like we may have another contradiction, right? We look at Paul's world, Paul's words, and he's talking about experiencing famine and nakedness. You look at Jesus' words, and he says, don't worry. Got you covered. Look at verses 32 and 33. But before we do, this is where I think we often like to forget. So what do we make of that apparent contradiction? God will give us what he thinks is needed for his glory and for his kingdom. Not what we think we need. Because here's what we think. Is that when we're suffering, we're being punished. For the most part. That's what we think. When we're suffering, we're being punished. What did I do wrong, God? What did I do wrong? Why am I going through all of this? And the answer is, very possibly, nothing. Nothing. We live in a fallen world. Could be an answer. So let's go back to verses 32 and 33 of Matthew. For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Do you believe Jesus is in control? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Ooh, there's a but there. A big capital B-U-T. Right? So what is this saying to it? It is Him who decides what we need and we don't need. What we get and we don't get. It's not according to our will. It's according to His will. And we don't like that. We do not like that. And that's why this is so hard for us to understand. Because we have to surrender to his will. We have to surrender to God if we have any chance of becoming a conqueror. It's what it means when he says, but first seek. 
kingdom and my righteousness. So what about what shall we eat? If you have enough, you praise God. If you don't have enough, guess what? You better praise God. You have enough to drink, you praise God. You don't have enough to drink, praise God. You got some nice clothes to wear, praise God. You don't have any clothes to wear, praise God. A contradiction, right? Surrender. Surrender. You're still not convinced? Let's read what Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We've heard these verses before. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will save it. We like to call these types of verses counterculture, right? Countercultural. How many times have we read this and not understood the magnitude of it? It is about denying ourselves. It is about surrendering to the kingdom, to God and his will. And until we figure that out, we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle. In our Western society of, remember the three seeds that Rev Kev has talked about. Convenience, comfort, control. That's what we're taught. Because we live in this Western society that we live in, right? So the concept of what I've been talking about is foreign to us. Because we're inundated with it day after day after day. And I do think that we believe we think we want what God wants. So let me say that again. I do believe that I think we think we want what God wants. But here's the catch I think that is really a part of it is we want what God wants on our terms. It's on our terms. And it may be obvious, but most of the time it's subtle. And I know that by what we do and how we act. And I'm looking in the mirror first and foremost. But here it is. Unfortunately, the kingdom of God does not work like that. The Christian life simply does not work like that. Period. It is not God's reality. So let's return to our power passage. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I believe that our ability to conquer is in direct relation to two things. Number one, guess what? Our willingness to surrender to him and his will. If you want to be a conqueror, just as Paul said, and to conquer all those things then you have to be willing to surrender to God and His will. Secondly, you have to be willing to undergo, guess what? Sufferings. You have to be willing to endure the sufferings because, again, remember, The suffering may have nothing to do with you doing anything wrong. Guess what? It may have everything to do with giving you the opportunity to glorify God. How about that contradiction? And I know because I know that I do not like that. But it is true. Remember the question that we started with from the catechism. 
What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So how do we glorify God? We glorify God by being more than conquerors, yes? We glorify God by being more than conquerors. And we become conquerors, more than conquerors, by doing what? Number one, by surrendering. Surrendering to God. That's how we become a conqueror. And number two, surrendering to the suffering. Believing its purpose can and will glorify God if we do it the right way. It's our chief end, right? Glorify God and enjoy Him. But here's the reason that we are not conquerors. I've got to say this too. And it's another contradiction. The more we surrender, there's a chance the more we suffer. And we don't like that either. Because that's not fair. It's not right. If I'm surrendering to God, life should be good. Well, it can be good, but it's not in the way that you and I think about being good. The more we surrender, the more we may suffer. That's why we're not conquerors today. In the end, in the end, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's about Him who rescued us, who saved us, and who loves us. It's about Him. We have got, we have got to understand and realign our views in line with God's. Let me read Jesus' words out of Luke chapter 21, verse 12. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. Right off the start. Sounds like some suffering that's going to happen to me. They will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors and all on the account of my name. It's about him. And so you will bear testimony to me, his will. But... Make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. Let me read that again. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. Surrender. You don't have to worry about it because you've surrendered to the will and he's going to give you. Guess what? In verse 15, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed. Here we go. We don't like this again. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, and sisters, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Here we go with that suffering theme again. And it gets no better because everyone will hate you because of me. You think Jesus is being literal here? Here we go. But not a hair of your head will perish. Why? Because Christ is interceding for you and me at the right hand of God. Stand firm and you will win life. Whew. 
come on. Come on. If we understand this, then that opportunity that I think we have at church, we'll be able to take advantage of that opportunity. But as importantly, for you and I, we will be able to start to meet our chief end of existence to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And subsequently, if we're able to do that, then we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. I don't know about you, but I'd love to be a conqueror these days. So let's pray. Ah, Jesus, I thank you for your words. Lord, I pray that everybody here and everybody's listening and everybody that may hear these words understand that you are the reason and your Holy Spirit are the reason that we are able to be a conqueror for you. Lord, I want just to have us all of the mess that's in front of us that causes us not to be, to be removed. And let us see, let us realize, let us know that we can be conquerors through you and that it will eventually lead to us glorifying you and the Father, Lord. So, Lord, this is my prayer to help us, to help us with everything that we have to become more than conquerors. So in Jesus' name I pray, amen.